yeah, looking at this 5G place is where everybody's heading in our community, right? You, in the ICC, literally, uh, apart from two academic keynotes, everybody spoke about 5G, but actually nobody knows what 5G will be. You know, we had this nice talk, for example, from our friend, uh, you know, Izat and his colleague, uh, but, you know, it will be actually the Qualcomm's of the world and Huawei who will determine, you know, which of the available technologies will be picked for 5G. So, what I would like to talk about is, is more uh, really uh, this kind of region here, and, and this is a little tool perhaps, you know, we, we could call it my, my walk with Shannon uh, throughout the decades, basically. So, looking at visible light communications lane, I wouldn't call it an avenue or a parkway or, or a, a boulevard because it's, it's part of that larger landscape, right? That's what I'm trying to say. And, and similarly, free space optical, because it's very good for the back hole, for example, and uh, various other uh, relatively niche applications. Uh, and then, of course, more long term, I think this is where actually Einstein and Shannon will meet, with Marconi, probably. So that will be quite some meeting, I think. Anyway, I would like to draw at some stage another map uh, which would be the map of quantum systems. And I just came from Edinburgh directly by Southampton where I gave a talk on, on quantum communications. Uh, but obviously this is a less mature area. Okay, so really this is still just on a, a very superficial note to start with. And I'd like to delve now into the spectrum issues a little more. Uh, this illustration is really our trademark. Everybody understands this extremely well, the, the wireless channel phase, both as a function of time uh, as well as a, as a function of frequency. And so this is very frequency selective and there's a signal-to-noise ratio fluctuation which is on the order of 20, 30 dBs. So we've been beavering away the past decades finding methods which allow us to mitigate this huge problem. But as uh, Mohammed so eloquently uh, outlined the problems, you know, there's a spectrum shortage, especially due to the data tsunami that uh, we experience because people are so incredibly smitten with browsing the web. You know, in fact, I just recently learned that this is a digression, but allegedly multitasking is not very good for you. Yet, you see people all the time multitasking and browsing in the underground or wherever you go, even when they're sipping their coffees anyway. So, a little bit on, on these wireless myths and realities and futures, if you are looking for just a sort of overview, as you may know, the proceedings of IEEE is really a, a multidisciplinary journal and uh, this was the uh, 100th anniversary uh, special issue of the IEEE uh, proceedings and uh, we had a paper there with a bunch of my professional friends and, and so we uh, looked at the pros and cons of uh, how we're going to proceed from 3G to 4G towards 5G and optical as well as quantum communications. On a more detailed note, I will talk about this paper uh, perhaps in a little more depth and then I will talk about uh, some uh, free space optical communication issues. So uh, the 10G challenge comes from uh, not jumping from the fifth generation to the tenth generation. It's more like can we communicate above 10 gigahertz and we had a panel session at WCRC where we jointly coined this terminology with a couple of uh, people on the panel, Harald Haas and a couple of uh, Siemens people. Mohammed put up this uh, slide already. Uh, your slide was much nicer, but this is uh, a vintage slide because it's from our book in 1999. Uh, basically, even then, uh, millimeter wave was potentially feasible, but there wasn't you know, MMICs available commercially. So basically, the understanding was there, the propagation issues were reasonably well understood. We know these problems that we've got the oxygen absorption zone, 
And so what is clear is as a function of frequency, the path loss goes up quite substantially. And uh, again, as Muhammad was, was elaborating on quite eloquently, you have to find uh, enabling techniques which compensate for this increased path loss. Now, let me use a very simple example, again, just to, to kickstart our discussion. So suppose, you know, I, I don't even care how many antenna elements I need. Just, just suppose that instead of using an omnidirectional antenna, which radiates in 360 degrees around you at whatever power, say just one watt, instead now what we could say is use sufficient number of antennas to get it down to 3.6 degrees. So I could beam up John over there without contaminating any of Muhammad's reception here. So that means we actually have 20 dBs gain uh, because ultimately all that energy, of course I'm neglecting all losses, everything else, instead of radiating on the direction and the same one what is now beamed down to John over there, right? So 20 dBs is the max I could get. So that kind of determines immediately how large I can make the cell, right? And of course then I can work backwards, I can work out how many antenna elements do I need to actually get to, you know, close to the 20 dBs, right? Of course we understand you can't really uh, travel at a high speed because uh, you've got a very narrow beam and therefore you've got suppose a 10 millisec transmission burst and that gives you you know only ever so infrequently a chance to update the beam forming weights and the angle of arrival estimates. So there is big problems there which we have to deal with as a community and today nobody really has all these solutions but what is clear is that uh, okay, so at millimeter waves, we do have the bandwidth. We don't have such a big bandwidth problem. However, we, we have this path loss problem, right? And so therefore, the MIMOs are not really needed in order to get more throughput, perhaps, uh, or, in fact, to mitigate the effects of fading, because there might be even line of sight. But what we do need is the beam forming. So that's why basically if you go to any of these focused uh, millimeter wave workshops, most people talk about beamforming. So let's dive into a little more detail now. You know, obviously I could carry on talking about how we go to higher and higher frequencies. And of course what happens is uh, the electromagnetic waves start to behave more like light. So it's becoming more and more line of sight oriented. Not totally, but more and more line of sight oriented. So there's a seamless transition. And you know, again, I'm here to kind of discuss with you to what degree uh, we can use the same kind of methods. Because it's the same electromagnetic wave we're talking about. And so ultimately, uh, we can potentially find a seamless transition from one domain to the other. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I, I'm logged on to the internet now, so I will not click on these links, but what is, it, what is clear is that uh, right now, uh, I misplaced, I think, the, oh, that works as well, uh, but I misplaced the other laser pointer. Can anybody see it? Hopefully we will find it in a minute. Okay, anyway, so uh, there's two powerful industrial consortia. This is a Japanese consortium. And this is uh, more of a European consortium. Uh, it was Harald Haas who coined this uh, light fidelity terminology uh, because it, it nicely goes with the wireless fidelity, the Wi-Fi terminology. And so, you know, therefore, uh, Harald refers to these as atom cells, right, rather than, you know, small cells or anything uh, else previously found in the literature. So what we are looking at here is basically a, a MIMO transmitter uh, in the light domain uh, where you've got 80 LEDs acting as 80 antennas, right? So actually I'm really just using terminologies in order to bridge the two domains with each other. So let me stop here for a moment and just ask whether I raised anything for discussion, whether anybody might like to contribute.
Raise your hand if you think I'm going too slow. Raise your hand if, I, if you think I'm going too fast. Anybody in the room? <laughs> okay, yeah, there's one, there's one person in the room. Okay, so let me now delve into a little more detail concerning optical wireless. And uh, color shift keying is actually a scheme uh, which was standardized by the IEEE. So I'm not conceiving color shift keying here. However, color shift keying can be improved uh, in comparison to what has been published in the literature. And in particular, because most of the time, the standard systems actually only specify the transmitter, not the receiver. And they keep or re you know, allow uh, manufacturers, etc., to develop their own receivers so that they innovate. And that's why you've got so many uh, you know, different receivers, but the transmitter has to be standardized uh, so that you know, everybody can uh, create receivers for those. So this is just a simple example of how to map uh, the information onto a color-coded scheme. So, you know, you could potentially imagine that we could map, for example, two or three bits onto different frequencies, if you like. Of course, in the light domain, uh, frequencies correspond to colors, right? And so, basically, I could use a, a mapping scheme, a bit-to-symbol mapping scheme, uh, which is like the one here in this illustration. So, for example, you could map 1, 1 to this bit, uh, 0, 0 to this particular position here, and uh, 1, 0 to that position, whereas 0, 1 to this position. So I've got uh, four different symbols, two bits mapped to four different symbols. And you could similarly conceive 8 PSK type, or, or rather I should say 8 CSK type schemes. So in this particular case, for example, this is 16 CSK, 8 CSK, and the difference between the top illustrations and the bottom illustrations is that these are so-called white balanced constellations. In other words, there is no cognizance given in the top illustrations here uh, as to whether the actual light, the visible light, will be white or colored. Whereas if you impose a constraint, then you have to position the points differently so that you actually perceive a white color. Now, in reality, those of you who work on, say, optical OFDM or optical comms in general uh, would be aware of the fact that we're not really using the entire uh, frequency band as such in order to generate uh, white light. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, what is important is that, again, there's two types of constellations with no color balance or color balance, and of course, the color balance best adjusted for giving you white light. Of course, you could map more bits to a, a symbol, but then the points get closer to each other. So again, we're talking here frequencies or colors. And so as the distance between these uh, symbols is reduced, we end up a more vulnerable constellation. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the propagation of light. And this is fairly anecdotal, really, just to entertain you a little uh, on a uh, kind of lighthearted uh, level. So obviously, if the propagation is perfect, and suppose, for example, there is no perturbations on the water surface here, then you would see just a single point. The sun would appear as a single point, but in reality, of course, uh, due to the waves, uh, you see uh, a dispersed signal here. So, uh, in contrast to the common concept, or conception rather, uh, that light only propagates in line of sight, uh, we see reflections, uh, certainly here, for example, you look at the laser light and you would see a reflection 
although again uh, to a limited extent, so the energy of the reflected waves uh, remains somewhat limited. But if we desire good receivers, then actually we can exploit even the reflected waves as well. Another interesting property, and again, in this sense, you can visualize how radio waves propagate. So in this example, you have here, uh, suppose, a base station, uh, which is, of course, in this particular case, more like a, a headlight. Uh, and so you see that the signal propagates and uh, that there is an extended propagation if the source of the light is higher, like we are used to in RF propagation. If you put up the base station on a high-rise tower, then uh, you can cover a larger area, but the variability of the received signal strength will be also more grave. So you don't get uh, so easily direct line of sight propagation. Whereas suppose you bring down, for example, the radio transmitters below the rooftop levels, then you can beam down the street almost in a direct line fashion. It's like a car, you know, traveling along the street. You channel all the energy into the street canyon. So you know, all these, these interesting properties of light help us also understand uh, the radio wave propagation. There's another interesting phenomenon. What you see here is that initially uh, the light is obstructed, but then propagation continues down here. Similarly, the light is here obstructed, but, but it continues. And so in indoor scenarios like here, what we're really talking about is replacing these um, energy efficient bulbs with LEDs, which are even cooler in a way, you know, more energy efficient because they convert the energy more efficiently into light than the incandescent bulb. And there's reflection from the walls. We would obviously see that uh, clearly if uh, we had a dark room here. So let me now move into uh, the receiver design. So far, we spoke about the transmitter and spoke about the propagation a little bit. Now I'd like to look at a sophisticated receiver of the kind which, for example, Wei Liang used to work on at Southampton. You know, she, she just finished her PhD uh, in iterative receivers and uh, cooperative uh, communications as a whole. So on the left-hand side here, we've got the bit-to-symbol mapping. And uh, as we discussed, we have these three different bands. Uh, there is also a MIMO matrix here, but this MIMO matrix is now in the optical domain as opposed to the radio frequency domain. But there is some crosstalk across the uh, photodiodes, which are the receivers, and the LEDs, which are the transmitters. Of course, you can ignore the crosstalk, and even that would work, but as you increase the speed, uh, then the speed of transmission, I mean, uh, then uh, there would be uh, more crosstalk and uh, more errors unless you actually uh, use joint detection. So the receiver side here, uh, really relies on either uh, a simple one-shot detector or we can use soft iterative detection, which normally works much better. If you compare at a fixed complexity a non-iterative receiver to an iterative receiver, the iterative receiver will always perform better. And a very simple example of this really to, to convince you can you just raise your hand if you work uh, in iterative receivers? Well, why well, is the only one apparently? Uh, okay, well, let me give you a very simple illustration which you can probably identify with. Suppose I, I consider a Viterbi decoder and a simple convolutional encoder which has, for example, 64 states. Okay, so. Uh, I can either use a non-iterative Viterbi decoder for the convolution decoder, or I could use a turbo decoder, a turbo encoder and decoder pair, 
where there's two receiver, well, decoder components, which have eight states. So there's two of them, then I have a total of 16 states. And I iterate four times, which means that in total, I will end up with 64 states being visited by the turbo decoder. And this turbo decoder vastly outperforms a non-iterative Viterbi decoder. So the bitter ratio curves of the two decoders would uh, compare somehow like in this illustration. Suppose this would be the Viterbi decoder and this would be the turbo decoder. And I would guess at 10 to the power minus 5, there would be easily at least 6 dBs difference between the two. Again, I fixed the complexity and mentioned uh, the benefits of iterative information exchange, soft information exchange between the receiver components. So because uh, apart from me, nobody is working on iterative decoders, I will not uh, delve into too much detail about this. Uh, but if you are interested, then again, you can uh, look at that paper and I can also send it to you if uh, you can't find it on the internet, but this is the paper uh, that uh, we're talking about. So moving on, let's characterize the achievable performance of this system with the aid of a three-stage concatenated receiver uh, the throughput of this is 2 bits per symbol. The throughput of this set of curves corresponds to 3 bits per symbol, and uh, these five curves correspond to 4 bits per symbol. So as you would expect, upon increasing the achievable throughput, you require a higher signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, again, like uh, our friend uh, from UCL portrayed earlier, Essentially, what we're talking about is capacity would be somewhere here. And uh, so I could also draw this on the capacity versus SNR scale. And so ultimately, we've got 2-bit per symbol, 3-bit per symbol, or 4-bit per symbol schemes. And it's only natural that we need a higher signal-to-noise ratio. What is also uh, quite clear from this illustration is that as we increase the number of iterations, this is with a single iteration, two iterations, three, four, five iterations. So as you see, obviously when we move from one iteration to two, we get the largest uh, increment in performance, about 13 dBs to about 9 dB, so it's 4 dB gain. And you double the complexity, you get 4 dB gain. There is always a complexity uh, versus um, performance trade-off or the other way around. And really, the only way we can get closer and closer to capacity is if we can afford a higher delay because we use a longer block code. That's Shannon's channel coding theorem. Or if we have a higher complexity, or both, right? So turbo codecs constitute a plausible manifestation of this because turbo codecs require relatively long interleaver, but they can get relatively close to the Shannonian uh, capacity upon iterating more and more times. But you also observe in this figure that as we iterated like three times, the additional gains beyond that remain more limited, and therefore, it's a bit like flogging a dead horse, if I may say this colloquially, because uh, any further complexity improvement or increase uh, only gets you marginally closer to capacity. So the way you can picture this is that you are pushing against a rubber wall, if you like. You know, the more you push, the harder uh, it gets to get even closer. So this was just really justifying uh, the benefits of iterative processing. And no doubt, 
in the realms of optical communications, this will also conquer much more ground than uh, its customary at today's state of the art. So what I would suggest here, I can stop for a moment and uh, we can have a little discussion before I delve into free space optical. Or if you prefer, then we can stop here altogether and just have a, a, a sort of free-flowing discussion. It's entirely up to you. John is boss. Uh, you, you can be the moderator and we can have a panel session. So any questions? you limit yourself to the, the visible spectrum? I mean, why not take an area there which is maybe more suited for the source, and the, or the, the laser or whatever it is, the source and the detector you need? Right. That's a perfectly legitimate question. And uh, I think in the spirit of how I started out, I'm not really limiting myself. All I'm trying to do here is uh, perhaps portray the image which you also advocate apparently, namely we're just talking about electromagnetic waves. And we started out talking about radio frequencies which are not visible to us. But there is also the infrared range, there's the terahertz range, and there's so many other frequency ranges which Muhammad also spoke about to a degree. So all these techniques are potentially applicable regardless of the actual frequency. But what we try to do is, is find modulation schemes that are best suited for the frequency range that we are considering. And so this is why I used here, you know, initially just talking about electromagnetic waves, but then I, I narrowed it down a little bit to uh, visible light. Uh, although, again, the same would be applicable to infrared. We all have these uh, remote controllers at home for television, for example. But of course, as we go higher and higher frequency, you know, that, then you suffer from more path loss, so the cells have to become smaller. And that's why terahertz, for example, although uh, there's bags of bandwidth there, but it has its limitations in terms of distance. Uh, just to give you an example, the automotive industry recently opted for the 120 gigahertz range, for example, uh, for Vanes, you know, uh, vehicular ad hoc networks. And, you know, that's another range which hitherto has been unused. So am I answering your question? I could move to the laser. Indeed, you know, the free space optical part, which uh, if we wanted to just carry on and look at the rest of the presentation, would be actually looking at laser light. Uh, and, and then, of course, the channel propagation properties are different again. So, so far I, I focused more on indoor scenarios and visible light. Um, when you move to free space optical, that's the realms of, for example, outdoors tower to tower communications where eye safety is not so much of an issue like it would be in indoor scenarios. Does it make sense? Excellent. And, and do, you, do you have your thoughts on, would you like to contribute a little more? No, the only thing I was wondering was so it's basically an artificial limitation you put there to keep your problem. Yeah, so that I can give you some results. Because yeah. if we consider, you know, the entire frequency range, uh, like Maxwell was talking about electromagnetic waves, without actually considering specific frequencies, then we cannot easily generate results. But you could, when I look at the, the color figures, you could take another area. You could say I take part of the visible, or I take yeah. the visible but a little bit of infrared with it? Yeah, abs absolutely. In fact, uh, again, good you mentioned this because I, I very briefly touched upon the point that uh, the, I think John would know much more about this, but I think the uh, receiver diodes are only sensitive to, to blue color. Uh, and so basically, uh, the speed of LEDs are today rather limited because they have not been designed for communications. And so basically, uh, what is the limiting factor is that the LEDs don't switch fast enough. You could just have on-off keying, for example, you know, uh, flickering the light, uh, which is way beyond the humanized fusion frequency, right? So it would not disturb us at all, 
uh, but the LEDs cannot switch very fast, so that's why actually that 80 LED bulb, which I showed, uh, would be a useful means of getting around that problem. So the bandwidth is there, but the LEDs are not fast enough. And so we need manufacturers who are actually trying to go into business with fast LEDs for communications and lighting together. Right? Oh, you had a, a point as well. Um, do you see any, any problem with um, ambient light? I mean, like, uh, yeah. the windows are too big uh, or the, is there? Well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, of course, um, what we're talking about to start with is that we have the lighting here, which is the primary function. Yeah. And then there is a technique referred to as dimming control. What we want to avoid is that the, you dim the light. You don't want to dim the light, so you normalize the power to be the same in all these investigations. But now, I think what you really wanted to allude to was more like sun, sunshine and you know, um, cars passing by and this kind of thing. And that is exactly the same as interference in uh, radio frequency communications when an adjacent base station, you know, Mohammed was talking about the cell edge users, right? A cell edge user is talking to a, a base station there, but it's interfering with the adjacent base station or with another cell edge user uh, who is in its vicinity, right? But we have to have the receivers, and as long as we are above the capacity, in other words, the SINR is high enough then it's a matter of designing good enough receivers that can work under those circumstances. Somebody had a question up there? Oh, oh yeah, go on. It's really interesting to see that HALA shift the key. For the reason I, so you mentioned something about the multi uh, MIMO transmission. Yeah. So for the light communication, usually it's a line of sight. So I'm just worrying a bit about the how can we make the diversity of the channel? Right. So I think that's the key thing for the memo. Right. So any idea how can we increase the diversity? Yes. So the first point I would like to make is I fully agree with your question, and this cropped up in my mind as well. I convinced myself to a reasonable uh, uh, satisfaction because, first of all, it's typically line of sight. So it's a Gaussian channel with some dispersion, okay? So you've got reflections from the wall, but in this room, no, nobody is really moving. There's no real fading. So I don't actually need a diversity gain as such, right? Uh, I do need an equalizer in a way if you push the bit rates to be very high because ultimately what matters is what is the the delay difference between the main line of sight path and the reflective path. So we can think backwards and say, all right, so as long as I'm not transmitting at a bit rate which is higher than, or the bit duration is shorter than the difference between the line of sight path, which is a dominant one conveying maybe 95% or 90% of the energy, I can ignore the reflective path. If I go beyond uh, or, or approach the, that path length uh, or, or the path delay rather uh, with the bit duration, then I need an equalizer because the eye diagram starts to close, right? And so then I need a more sophisticated receiver. And we're talking about the same thing again, you know, the complexity or rather integrity versus complexity. Does it make sense what I'm saying? That means uh, we need to spend more energy on the long line of sight to right. increase the diversity. Right. It's, it's in a way, it's a design decision uh, for the system because I could think again backwards and I might say, okay, so I can actually slow down the transmissions. I can every time, uh, you know, if this problem crops up, I can just slow down transmissions, make the bit duration uh, longer so that the dispersion doesn't cause much disruption, much, much uh, interference, uh, and then double up having maybe four LEDs or even more like 80 LEDs. So 
the option is a single LED transmitter and receiver or a hundred LEDs which you can go to B and Q and buy it and then you can have a hundred times longer symbol duration. So dispersion is no longer a problem. Mm -hmm. right? So we're engineers here and we can always find a, a solution to get around these problems. I think you had a question as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm having fun with your question, so give me more. <laughs> right. Well, I want to one very quick, simple question. How, how bright is, would these lights be? Would it, could they be potentially dangerous? Or? No, no. I mean, these are, you know, ordinary LEDs, which you buy from B&Q. So, uh, of course, uh, quite seriously. I, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I go to B&Q fairly regularly, and they, they have an advert... Um, if you buy 10 of these bulbs, I think it's 30 pounds. So, but if you buy one, it would cost you probably five or more, right? So they actually tried to popularize the LEDs because, uh, you know, that's probably against global warming. You know, basically uh, we've got these uh, G7 summits or whatever where they agree about targets. And one way to do this is to bring down CO2 emissions. So instead of the hot uh, incandescent bulbs which radiate more heat than actual light, the LEDs are brighter uh, certainly for a, a given wattage. So they're not a problem for the eye. Uh, one other question, I mean, do you, do you, uh, and like, you know, you're in, you're in colour um, with Keen, so do you do like, you know, what's, what's polarisation for, 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 vi for visual light? I mean, Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, could you, I mean, like, I mean, how much could you scale this up? Is well, uh, the, the first straightforward answer uh, would be that, yes, you could have uh, vertical and horizontal polarization, uh, but there is also a, a modulation technique uh, referred to as twist modulation. I don't know. Anybody heard of twist modulation? I haven't worked on it, uh, but I'm very intrigued by it, and maybe it's something that our community should uh, explore in, in some more detail. And, you know, there's a, really... In, in my mind, again, like, like we discussed, the electromagnetic waves in general, uh, you know, the modulation format has to be adjusted to a degree to the frequency range we are talking about or to that particular incarnation of the electromagnetic waves that we are trying to exploit. And so, you know, if you compare, for example, GSM and, uh, and the 4G systems, LTE, OFDM, very different modulation schemes, right? A GSM uh, used uh, Gaussian minimum shift keying, which at that state of the art was a very powerful technique, and uh, it was designed to be very robust to coach an interference. That's a good example. But there are other good examples like CSK, for example, which is again matched to, to the visible light domain. And uh, it would have to be explored whether it would work all right, uh, say, for free space optical. Because, again, you know, coming back to you, so that would be another example, another design example, if you like, uh, for a very different application. And uh, there, the eye safety would be a problem, as you said. So we would not use high-power laser, obviously, for the indoor applications. Nothing like even in, in discos or, or anything like that. John? Do you see free space as a sort of existing on its own without being part of a sort of wider radio ecosystem? I'm just thinking practically. My phone spends most of its time living in my pocket. Right. Which suggests I would, may never get connection if there was only a, a, free, a free space. Or, but how is... How well, okay. So the way I envisage this to become part of the heterogeneous landscape, which again Mohammed speaks about quite a lot, is that you will have a whole plethora of different solutions. And if you are sitting in here, um, many of you have got, the, uh, you, I just see three, four iPhones here down on. gigabits of information uh, on the table and could be downloading gigabits of information. Again, this is not very good for the uplink uh, because it's not so convenient. However, again, as I say, 
just part of that heterogeneous uh, landscape, but in the uplink you would use your Wi-Fi. That means you free up the Wi-Fi downlink, so you actually double up on the Wi-Fi capacity. So you could almost imagine in here that each one of these is a separate small cell effectively. Exactly. That's exactly how I'm, uh, that's exactly. If I wanted to download, I would have to. Yeah. Yeah. But it's got, you know, lots of advantages because as opposed to, you know, you go to an airport, oh, I wonder whether they have free Wi-Fi. And, and here, well, you can actually see that you've got visible light. You can see the cells, right? So you actually just sit down and you can be damn sure that you've got coverage, for example. Right? Not coverage that's the issue, it's charging. Well, no, that's, an, that's another important point. And again, I don't want to masquerade here. I, I haven't got any vested interests. I'm not you know, gaining from this. I haven't got a patent in it. All I'm saying is that, uh, okay, the government might start charging even for visible light, but not in my home, right? I mean, they can't do that. So I could actually just get out of my Wi-Fi contract uh, with BTs and download on visible light. But you need the power line communications behind it if you want to do it that way. Uh, or you might need other ways of getting into the house, like uh, with free space optical, where on your chimney is next to the TV antenna, you've got a free space optical receiver. Right? Uh, what I'm trying to do is really you know, fire you guys up. That there's so many interesting open problems for our community. And these have to be solved, answered, so that when industry is uh, looking for the next solution, it's there. I mean, it's interesting that point, and as, as Mohammed was saying earlier, that this whole idea, we've sort of been locked into this idea of you're, you're using 3G or 4G, and it's, that means uplink, downlink, control channel, everything is one technology. Yeah. But Carrier actually, aggregation, all yeah, the rest of it. We could start thinking that actually maybe I could be downloading, you know, my control channel is on the GSM macro cells, but I'm downloading high bandwidth through, through light. And Exactly. Those bound, those, 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 that binding between the two could be very powerful. Exactly. And again, that goes back to the idea of just electromagnetic waves. So we need you know, wideband receivers which can pick up whatever energy is coming your way, basically. But certainly the light, you know, like we're not paying for oxygen here, uh, we might have to pay when we go up to you know, Hualong uh, uh, Mountain in China, about four or 5,000 meters, but certainly not here, right? Anyway, so that was a good discussion, yeah. The last point is control vector separation. I think this works very well with two different technologies because small cells, millimeter wave is very good candidate because it does not have very long range penetration. Exactly. It can really create a nice small cell. And for the control, you can have uh, current technologies on macro cells to cover, say, several kilometers to area. Absolutely. Area. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, please, go ahead. I would argue that these are already have them. <coughs> because if I purchase my laptop in my office, I have a cable plugged into the network, and at the same time, I have a Wi-Fi on it. And they are often on two completely different networks. Or they are working together on the same office network. Invariably, it will use one or the other between one sort of socket set to Windows. You are likely to be sending requests out to one and bringing requests back between the data back to the other. Window. Once we, yeah, once we would maybe be more uh, agree yeah. with the yeah. But I have your phone may be able to operate on GSM and Wi-Fi, but invariably it's doing one, one or the other. It's not mixing the technology depending on which the control channel needs, the data channel up with the data channel down with. It could be that you're doing whatever's most appropriate at the moment and you're doing the best quality of service or load balancing within the network is appropriate. And but I am using this for multiple, I'm using it both internet at the same time. It's not on one side, the B internet and the other is the office internet network. And uh, through all the magic of IT, I figure it out. Well, I think you know, so many things are feasible and we're the people to make it happen in a way. So I guess uh, if I can just uh, quote Mark Twain uh, when we talk about the future, he, he actually said, well, it, it's difficult to make predictions. He said, especially about the future. <laughs> right? And uh, you know, native people obviously pick up the, the, the gist of, of this. 
So I think we, we probably will not delve into the free space optical. Uh, in a different methods can be used, but you've seen one design example, and we've got a good number of papers. If you go to my website uh, or our website at Southampton, you would find uh, particular links uh, which are freely downloadable, both on uh, CSK and uh, extending all the way to quantum communications. You, you remember that I had that little street going up tangentially, and actually that's where I think the, the really long-term future of, of communications might be. It's not a well, well understood area, uh, but now, for example, we are organizing a workshop at Globecom, and uh, the deadline uh, is, is, is actually tomorrow, but will be extended by two weeks. So if you know anybody, spread the gospel. We're trying to catalyze interest in, in this very exciting, weird and wonderful research area. So thank you for the insightful questions. I much enjoyed chatting to you. And send me an email if you want to raise further points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you.